Now, Israel and Iranian envoys have traded verbal blows in a Security Council meeting on the Middle East that was largely focused on the situation in Gaza. It comes after Israel vowed to respond to Iran's aerial strikes against its territory that's over the past weekend after a suspected Israeli attack on Iran's consulate in Damascus. Syria killed a senior leadership of that country's military establishment, including the Revolutionary Guard. Now, both envoys accused the other of representing a terrorist state, while members of the Security Council looked on. Thank you, Mr. President. Israel's envoy accused Iran of being a terrorist state, pointing to its aerial assault last Saturday as just the latest example of what he called the Ayatollah regime's blood-soaked history. The Ayatollah regime's foreign minister, Hussein Amir Abdolian, is a member of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. This terror organization, the IRGC, is responsible for carnage, bloodshed, and destruction worldwide. From terror attacks in South America and assassination plots of, on European and American soil to arms trafficking in Africa and terror sponsorship across the Middle East, the IRGC is in the business of murder. The IRGC is a designated terrorist organization not only in Israel, not only in the United States, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. He accused Iran of ensuring Hamas was able to carry out the October 7th attack while providing weaponry to Hezbollah in Lebanon, whom Erdan also accuses of raining down missiles on Israeli towns and cities in its northern regions. Yet, instead of designating the IRGC as a terror organization and sanctioning Iran's evil regime, the Security Council opens its doors for Iran's foreign minister, for a terrorist. Can you not see what is going on here? Terror Minister Abdolian is not here to express sorrow for his regime's brazen attack and tell this council that the Islamic Republic has changed its ways. He is here to make a mockery of you. He is here to show you all, in your suits and with your diplomatic niceties, that his country can launch an attack on another member state on Saturday, and then he can come here on Thursday to lecture you all on human rights and, inter and international law. Minister Abdolian's presence here today is making this institution a joke. The minister in question arrived later to assert Iran's right to self-defense against the suspected Israeli attack on its consulate in Syria, lamenting the lack of international condemnation against Israel for that strike. It was carried out in response to a series of attacks and recurring aggressions by the Israeli regime in form of missile attacks on Iran's interests, especially on our embassy in Syria. Thirdly, it took place in the fulfillment of Iran's right to legitimate defense under international law. Fourthly, it was conducted by observing the criterion of non-aggression to civilian people and places. He again asserted that Iran's self-defense actions had been concluded amid strong indications from Israel that it would respond. The Israeli regime, the terrorist Israeli regime, must be compelled to stop any further military adventurism against our interests. Certainly, in case of any use of force by the Israeli regime and violating our sovereignty, the Israeli Republic of Iran will not hesitate a bit to assert its inherent right to give a decisive and proper response to it to make the regime regret its actions. This is an unchangeable decision. The United States envoy also confirmed fresh sanctions against Iran's unmanned aerial program, its largest steel producers and automobile companies with connections to the Revolutionary Guard. Iran has provided significant funding and training for the military wing of Hamas, which, as we know, perpetrated unspeakable acts of cruelty on October 7 against Israelis, Americans, and citizens from countries all over the world. This long-standing Iranian support 
continues to contribute to the current crisis in Gaza. While Iran's minister will offer excuses for these actions today, we have a collective responsibility to set the record straight on Iran's nefarious actions to ensure that Iran both complies with the Council's resolutions and ceases its violations of international law. Mr. President. Earlier, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned the Council that the Middle East was on a precipice and one miscalculation away from a full-scale regional escalation that would be devastating for those involved and the rest of the world. Shervin Ricefee's SABC News, New York. Right, to recap on the events taking place in New York, we are joined now by SABC News correspondent at the UN headquarters, Sherwin Brian, Bryce Peace. Uh, Sherwin, a very good evening to you. A lot of reaction on the ground, fingers being pointed at Iran, raising a lot of questions at the same time. What are some of the reactions you've observed on your end as this uh, story continues to capture momentum? Well, there's so many thrusts in terms of what has been playing itself in this, uh, playing itself out in poor in the Security Council today. You, of course, have as a backdrop to that conversation that sparring between the uh, Israeli uh, uh, ambassador and the uh, foreign minister of Iran. You also have a process that is currently unfolding in the Security Council as it pertains to Palestine's request, its application for full membership of the United Nations. So while you have the Israelis and the Iranians going at each other, there is a process that has been focused on whether Palestine will be able to accede to full membership of this institution and become the 194th UN member state. Now, as you might be aware, there was an admissions committee that met twice uh, before the, today's meeting, uh, a subsidiary body of the UN Security Council that failed to reach consensus on approving uh, uh, Palestine's uh, membership, uh, but that does not limit the full Security Council to convene as it is doing currently, uh, where we now expect just moments from now, a vote will take place on whether the Security Council will approve that uh, application by, by Palestine and then send it to the UN General Assembly where two thirds majority is required to complete the process. Let me quickly read to you Article 4 and 4 of the UN Charter. It says membership in the UN is open to all peace-loving states which accept obligations of the UN Charter. The admission of such a state to membership of the UN will be effected by a decision of the General Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council. So, what then will transpire in the moments ahead? The United States, which has veto power in the UN Security Council, has already indicated that it does not support Security Council action as it regards to Palestinian statehood. It believes that the Palestinians should be engaging directly with the Israelis in direct negotiations on the broader issues of a two-state solution that will inform the decisions of the United Nations in terms of giving Palestine full membership. What the Palestinians are arguing is we've waited long enough, right? They've waited seven plus decades uh, for uh, recognition within the United Nations and as an internationally recognized Palestinian state. None of those two things Things have happened uh, outside of the multilateral process and so their argument is it needs to happen now because it will help foster peace in the broader Middle East region and so we are moments away from what could be a historic decision but uh, the United States has already choreographed its uh, decision here uh, that if Palestine receives the minimum of nine votes in favor of the resolution in the Security Council now the United States will inevitably use its veto to block that recommendation to the, to the UN General Assembly moving forward. And what will that mean for Palestine? I mean, they are hoping that this move does get some approval and the, the impact of its membership will signify great strides. Well, we could argue, right, from both sides of the equation as to whether this will actually change the calculus on the ground. Will it improve conditions for Palestinians? There are divergent views on that from the opposing sides in that regard. But let me tell you what is at play more broadly in terms of what the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres told the meeting uh, uh, on the Middle East in the Council earlier today. The Middle East is on a precipice. Recent days have seen a perilous escalation in words and deeds. One miscalculation, one miscommunication, one mistake 
it could lead to the unthinkable, a full-scale regional conflict that would be devastating to all involved. He also then touched on issues of humanitarian aid, which of course, there are huge deficits that are still being uh, experienced in Gaza, where some 2.3 million people continue to face a humanitarian catastrophe. He did talk about some improvements in terms of getting more trucks filled with aid into the, the Gaza Strip, but this is not sustainable, it's not predictable, and the, the, the risk of starvation still proliferates uh, across uh, the Gaza Strip. He also talked about the two-state solution, which informs kind of what's going on in the council right now. He said the ultimate goal remains a two-state solution, Israel and Palestine living side by side in peace and security with Jerusalem as the capital of both states. On the basis of UN resolutions, international law and uh, previous agreements, he also talked about how the Middle East is on a knife edge. Recent escalation makes it even more important to support the good faith efforts to find a lasting peace between Israel and a fully independent, viable and sovereign Palestinian state. Failure to make progress, Mpo is what the Secretary General says, failure to make progress towards a two-state solution will only increase volatility and risk of hundreds of millions of people across the region who will live under the constant threat of violence. So we can't underestimate the importance of the Security Council decision. There are, of course, divergent views as to its impact on the ground. What the Palestinians believe is a uh, is is uh, articulating in a broader sense is the frustration that more than seven decades they are still not recognized as a full fully fledged independent state at the United Nations, no less uh, by the multilateral institutions around the world. So, so you say that the US is calling for these negotiated settlements, but as matters stand right now, there are no negotiations. What are the likelihoods of, of achievement, of achieving this uh, um, envisioned negotiation? I mean, I guess we have to walk before we can run, right? And walking would be resolving the current conflict in Gaza. Uh, there have been appeals, there have been Security Council resolutions to that effect, calling, for example, for a, a Ramadan ceasefire, which was largely ignored by Israel. And so dealing with that conflict, arresting the conflict, getting more humanitarian aid is the immediate imperative as to where we go from here. But without dealing with Gaza, without dealing with the humanitarian crisis, without ending the bullets, uh, we are not going to get two direct negotiations. I'm just looking to the left of my screen here, and Paul, it does look that, like the Security Council is now taking that vote as to whether uh, to make that recommendation to the General Assembly. I wonder if we should be listening to that. But as I continue here, uh, it seems that the United States has vetoed. It does seem that the United States has now vetoed that resolution. I saw the hand raised by Robert A. Wood, the alternate ambassador of the United States to the United Nations. So um, I, I don't have the audio up here, but it does seem that this resolution will go no further given the U.S. veto. So that's the breaking news out of New York. The United States has vetoed. Uh, a, a Algerian drafted resolution that would have recommended full membership of the, the state of Palestine to the General Assembly, where a two thirds majority vote would have been needed. 12 votes in favor, one vote against, two abstentions. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the Council. I now give the floor to those members of the Council who wish to make statements after the vote. I pass the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. <coughs> Madam President. Madam President. Madam President. This day may go down in history as a day when, after three quarters of a century, the international uh, community at last made the right choice on the path towards correcting the many years of historical injustice done to Palestine and the legitimate aspirations of its heroic people. Because it was a simple question, are the Palestinians worthy of being part of the global family fully participating in all of the decisions of international life. And a question that we have constantly answered with consent. And when Israel was welcomed into the UN, and when dozens of states also released from the colonial yoke were welcomed into the UN, 
However, our American colleagues believe differently. Having for the fifth time since the beginning of the uh, exacerbation in Gaza their veto, they have once again demonstrated what they really think of the Palestinians. For Washington, they do not deserve to have their own state. They are only a barrier on the path towards realizing the interests of Israel. For that reason, the United States is ready to the last to turn a blind eye to the crimes of Israel against the civilians in Gaza, not noting the uh, illegal settlement building activity in West Jerusalem on the West Bank. The aim is to break the Palestinians' will to force them once and for all to submit to the occupying power to once and for all to submit to the occupying power to turn them into a servants and second class persons and perhaps to once and for all force them out of their native territory that policy is only having the opposite impact at present an absolute majority of the global community supports palestine's application to become a full member of the World Organization. The suffering of Palestinian civilians is resounding in the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world. In countries that supply weapons to West Jerusalem, Jerusalem there are louder and louder voices calling, voices calling for those supplies to be banned. Today's use of the veto by the U.S. delegation is a hopeless attempt to um, stop the inevitable course of history. The results of the vote, where Washington was practically in complete isolation, speak for themselves. With the most, uh, uh, playing into the hands of the most irrational actions by their ally and reluctant to find just solutions on the basis of the existing international legal basis, is a direct path to the further sliding into the mire of war which could encompass the entire region. If the United States and Israel uh, benefit from this, then it will only be in the short term. At the same time, Washington will once and for all remove itself from the list of peace-loving and respected states, having um, fully uh, shared responsibility with its Israeli allies for the deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians. And that is not worthy of a great power, and history will not forgive you for that. We call on the United States to listen to the voice of reason, to think about the consequences of their decisions, and to immediately join in the efforts of the other members of the Security Council to establish an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation and pass the floor to the United States. Thank you, Madam President. The United States has worked vigorously and with determination to support Palestinian statehood in the context of a comprehensive peace agreement that would permanently resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Since the attacks of October 7, President Biden has been clear that sustainable peace in the region can only be achieved through a two-state solution with Israel's security guaranteed. There is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and future as a democratic Jewish state. There is no other path that guarantees Palestinians can live in peace and with dignity in a state of their own. And there is no other path that leads to regional integration between Israel and all its Arab neighbors, including Saudi Arabia. We also have long been clear that premature actions here in New York, even with the best intentions, will not achieve statehood for the Palestinian people. As members of the Security Council, we have a special responsibility to ensure that our actions further the cause of international peace and security and are consistent with the requirements of the UN Charter. As reflected in the report of the Admission Committee, there was not unanimity among committee members as to whether the applicant met the criteria for membership as set forth in Article 4 of the UN Charter. For example, there are unresolved questions as to whether the applicant meets the criteria to be considered a state. We have long called on the Palestinian Authority to undertake necessary reforms to help establish the attributes of readiness for statehood and note that Hamas, a terrorist organization, is currently exerting power and influence in Gaza, an integral part of the state envisioned 
in this resolution. For these reasons, the United States voted no on this Security Council resolution. Again, the United States continues to strongly support a two-state solution. This vote does not reflect opposition to Palestinian statehood, but instead is an acknowledgement that it will only come from direct negotiations between the parties. A central focus of U.S. policy prior to October 7, the October 7 Hamas terrorist attacks, was to promote normalization between Israel and its Arab neighbors and, as a critical element of a normalization package, generate tangible benefits and a political horizon for the Palestinian people. This was based on the U.S. judgment that normalization is the most viable pathway to make progress on what had been an intractable situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. In the aftermath of October 7, conversations on potential normalization and a political horizon for the Palestinians that would lead to statehood and membership at the UN have continued. Hamas and its Iranian backers would probably prefer this effort not succeed, but we are determined to see it through. It remains the U.S. view that the most expeditious path towards statehood for the Palestinian people is through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority with the support of the United States and other partners. We believe this approach can tangibly advance Palestinian goals in a meaningful and enduring way. We also believe, in light of Iran's unprecedented and outrageous actions over the last week, that Israel's neighbors would stand to benefit greatly from normalization. The United States is committed to intensifying its engagement with the Palestinians and the rest of the region, not only to address the current crisis in Gaza, but to advance a political settlement that will create a path to Palestinian statehood and membership in the United Nations. The United States will continue to oppose unilateral measures that undermine the prospect of a two-state solution. This includes any actions that violate the principles that Secretary Blinken has emphasized for months, that Gaza cannot be a platform for terrorism, there should be no Israeli reoccupation of Gaza, and the size of Gaza's territory should not be reduced. As we have said before, we believe a two-state solution coupled with these elements is the best way to achieve a durable peace in the region, along with security for Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States and pass the floor to the representative of France. Je vous remercie, Madame la... Thank you, Madam President. France would like to thank Algeria for proposing this resolution, which it voted in favor of. It is time to achieve a global political settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There you have it, uh, the decision being made there, um, that request uh, not being adopted as uh, Palestine was uh, seeking, of course, to get uh, full membership to the UN Security Council. And of course, uh, the Americans, uh, the US, uh, uh, of course, uh, having the uh, decision there to, to veto this move. And, and the reaction that you are looking at there and uh, the representative from the US giving reasons why they believe that this move is not one which is beneficial saying that uh, a two-state solution is the best way to achieve uh, the desired peace and we also of course heard the reaction that came from the the, the majority of, of those who were hoping that uh, the Palestine will be granted full membership to the UN Security Council Sherwin I know you're still on the line having uh, looked at uh, what has now transpired history in any sense has been made as we listen to the reasons um, that uh, the colleagues are saying that the, the American colleagues believe differently and the veto demonstrate what they really think of Palestinians.
Well, essentially, Robert A. Wood, the alternate ambassador uh, for the United States, uh, essentially saying, as you have uh, very well articulated there, Paul, that uh, their vote, their veto here is not an opposition. It doesn't mean the United States opposes Palestinian statehood, he said, but it's an acknowledgement that it will only, in their view, come from those direct negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. He says the best approach is those direct ne negotiations. And Robert A. Wood has made this case to us before in, in terms of that subsidiary body, the admissions committee of the UN Security Council that met in two rounds and failed, excuse me, to uh, reach consensus. And he believed the process should have then stopped there, given the fact that there was no consensus in the council about moving this process forward. Uh, but the Algerians then still moved ahead and put this draft resolution, essentially a draft resolution that says uh, Palestine will be uh, fully admitted to the United Nations. And we now, you know, send this uh, uh, this decision to the General Assembly, where then uh, Palestine would have needed to, re to receive two thirds majority. And uh, the, the breakdown of the vote in the Security Council gives you a sense that they might very well have received uh, a two-thirds majority in the General Assembly. Uh, Twelve countries out of the 15 countries in poor in the UN Security Council voting in favor, the United Kingdom and Switzerland abstaining, uh, the United States of course vetoing, but just to go through uh, who's in the Council, China voting in favor, Russia voting in favor, France voting in favor. Those are the permanent members, the UK abstaining, USA vetoing. Then you have the non-permanent members, Ecuador in favor, Japan, a close US ally in favor, South Korea, another close US ally in favor, Algeria in favor, Slovenia, a European country in favor, Malta in favor, Mozambique uh, from the SADC region in favor, Switzerland abstaining, Guyana from the Caribbean voting in favor, and another African country, Sierra Leone, voting in favor. So the vast majority of UN member states support Palestinian statehood. Uh, the obstacle here are the rules of the United Nations, right? The fact that this one country has a veto power and can really stymie, block an entire process. And remember, so you talk about history being made. Uh, there's also a sense of history being made with a sense of deja vu, because you'll remember the Palestinians tried to receive uh, their full membership back in 2011. They were then admitted as a, a non-member observer state uh, in 2012 by the General Assembly. Uh, but they have faced uh, opposition from the Security Council in the past. In fact, uh, that admissions committee back in 2011 could not reach consensus and the process stopped there, we didn't even get a Security Council vote. So it does also speak to the fact that the calculus here in New York has changed, uh, country positions in the Security Council have changed, Palestine clearly has the wind at their back given the vast majority of support here. The problem is the lack of Security Council reform, right, which is an, also an ongoing process. And the fact that one country with so much power can block an entire process by voting no. And that is exactly what the United States has done uh, this evening here in New York. Yeah, and one country with all that power, as we listen to some of the uh, reasoning that came with it there, um, the response and the reaction to that decision, what we did hear is that uh, the aim of the U.S. is to break the Palestinians and force them out of their native territory and urging the U.S. to perhaps rethink this position. Well, I mean, this is obviously there are political ramifications on uh, the Biden administration, for example, voting in favor of Palestinian uh, uh, membership of the United Nations. It will become a political football uh, in the United States, right? And, and, uh, no less in an election year. And so uh, if the uh, Democratic administration of Joe Biden were to vote in favor of Palestinian uh, membership, uh, the Republicans would be all over this in, in a second. And so, you know, politics is often very domestic. And so uh, multilateral international efforts uh, tend to uh, take a back seat uh, when the implications on the domestic front uh, would be very acute for uh, any decision uh, that would favor Palestinian uh, um, full membership of the United Nations, given the opposition that exists within the United States, within the Democratic Party itself in, in the United States, and the implications of that uh, for Joe Biden in an election year. So uh, that kind of does give you a broader understanding of why perhaps the United States made this position. It's the speculation coming from your correspondent here at the United Nations and not the official position, but one tends to read the tea leaves uh, when decisions of this are handed down. The, the big focus continues to be 
arresting and poor the situation in the Gaza Strip, getting more humanitarian aid in. Uh, and as you mentioned and correctly asked me earlier, you know, what's the point of referring to two-state solution negotiations, direct negotiations uh, that are non-existent and have been non-existent for a long time? And the goodwill between the parties, the building blocks for those direct negotiations simply do not exist today. Too many people have died on both sides here. The emotions one imagines between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the people in Gaza in particular, uh, the emotions are still very raw. And so how do you have create building blocks so that you can get to a point where direct negotiations between these two warring sides, these long-standing warring parties, uh, how, you know, how do you get to a, a situation where they will talk to each other? It's difficult to talk to each other uh, when you are still burying your dead, when you have still, you know, no access to health care, no access to food, no access to predictable supplies of humanitarian aid. And these are uh, the immediate questions that need to be resolved in the short term, in the medium term, before you then get to uh, direct negotiations. And so it really does undermine, in a sense, the U.S. argument that points to direct negotiations that are non-existent today, and they're unable to provide a timeline as to when those direct negotiations might happen. Very well. Let's uh, perhaps uh, leave it there for now. Uh, of course, uh, bringing us uh, that update on a breaking international story. SABC News correspondent at the UN headquarters, show and Bryce Peace, talking to us about how the US has now vetoed a UN resolution on Palestine membership. A story, of course, that uh, uh, continues to develop insofar as reactions are concerned across the world.